This is Fresh Tracks Weekly. So it's been a good last couple of weeks. Uh, the whole crew actually just got back from a fence pole where we pulled an old barbed wire fence out about a mile and a half. Uh, this fence was a barrier to pronghorn migration. So that's what we we're talking about for this week's deeper dive and just migration barriers in general. There's some new science, some interesting stuff. So stay tuned for that. But before the fence pull, it did manage to get out and do some fishing, and the fishing has been pretty good in the last couple of weeks. A group of us spent the 4th of July week backpacking, pack rafting, and catching some cutthroat trout, so that was a blast. Uh, even broke out the fly rod because the fishing was that good. You could just throw whatever dry fly you wanted, and they were just crushing it. Good times, for sure. Uh, did manage also to get out a few times for sheep scouting. The first time I went out got completely skunked, did not see a single sheep. So that was a little disappointing, saw some mountain goats, but uh, went out with some friends after that. And we did find a few smaller rams, nothing that I got too excited about, um, and some ewes and lambs. But yeah, I just love being on top of the mountains in general, hanging out with Kara and our friends and catching some fish for dinner. It's just, yeah, good times all around. But Michael has been fishing all over the state the last few weeks, so we gotta go hear his update. All right, guys, welcome back to the Fishing Corner. I hope everyone had an amazing week, and thank you for joining me in this corner. So last week was a holiday week. I took it off with my girlfriend, Cassie. We went fishing. We did some warm water stuff. We were targeting largemouth bass, which is not kind of common here in Montana, but we were able to kind of figure it out over a couple of days. Um, Cassie caught a few. I caught a few. We caught some smallmouth. We caught a few pike. It was a great trip. It was fun to go out and explore some new waters in the jet boat and got some really cool clips to show you here. Hope you enjoy those. When we got back from that trip, we started chasing the infamous salmon fly hatch here in Montana. Um, big bugs up to three inches, really, really quite a spectacle to see. Um, we had a rough time catching fish on those, but we wound up catching a few and the caddis hatches in the afternoon were really good and we were able to also catch some fish on top doing it that way, fishing caddis. Um, we hit the Missouri one day and that was pretty good as well. We, we wound up catching a few on, on dry flies, which is always a fun thing to do. Um, got, a, got a few of them nymphing as well. And the trout fishing is really starting to turn on and, and be really good. Um, what else did we do? I've been fishing in the backyard a little bit, catching little brookies and brown trout on top, which is sweet, sweet. And I'm on day 95 right now of 2023. Got 95 days under my belt. Been getting after it real hard. Um, this weekend, I'm heading on a three-day float trip with some of my buddies for a bachelor party, so that should be really fun. And I'm looking forward to showing you guys some content from that next week. So for episode 48, this is the Fishing Corner, Mike P. I'm signing off. Thanks for having me, Marcus. All right, now we'll go on to a few headlines and stories. A few weeks back, a train derailed on a bridge crossing the Yellowstone River in Montana. The bridge collapsed and 10 rail cars ended up in the river and ended up spilling molten sulfur and asphalt into the water. Montana Rail Link said in a statement that both of these substances solidify rapidly when exposed to cooler temperatures and that the initial water quality sampling showed no impacts to water quality and there was no public safety concern. But as time has gone on, asphalt has been spotted as far down as 110 miles downstream and several wildlife species have been found dead or oiled birds that are unable to fly. Initial reports on the affected wildlife do seem to be fairly isolated with only around eight instances so far. But as of a few days ago, the cleanup crews had collected over 80,000 pounds of material from the river. It has become apparent though that a significant amount of the material will not be able to be recovered. There's estimates as high as about 500,000 pounds of asphalt having been spilt, and that is leading some to question what the true environmental impact will be from the spill. Alexis Bonavosky has taken the time and initiative to document some of the spill and impacted wildlife and has brought up multiple concerns of what the impact will be to the river. She noted how there's very little known about liquid asphalt spills, citing a research paper that looked into these liquid asphalt release events into aquatic environments. From that report, it did note that liquid asphalt can have various effects on wildlife, especially as it begins to break into smaller pieces. 
There could also be potential bioaccumulation problems where the animals are affected moving up the food chain. Depending on the batch of that asphalt, it could also have different toxicity levels and it can either float or sink depending on slight chemical differences. So while many remain optimistic about the impact to the water, fish and wildlife and hoping that it'll be minimal, we likely won't know the true impact for years to come. In Montana, starting a couple weeks ago, all users of fishing access sites will now be required to have a conservation license. In previous years, the public had been allowed to use fishing access sites free of charge, while accessing a wildlife management area or Montana school trust lands required a state lands recreation license. But this year, the legislature, along with Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks and the Department of Natural Resources and Conservation, consolidated that state lands recreation license with the existing conservation license. To have a fishing or hunting license in Montana, you already had to have a conservation license regardless, but the increasing use of these lands and access points by recreational users raise concerns that they should be paying their fair share. For example, if you drive by the lower Madison River in Montana, it is very evident that on a hot summer day, you can see hundreds of floaters at the same time on the river, all parking at fishing access sites and parking lots are just overflowing. So now moving forward, those floaters have to buy that $8 conservation license or $10 if they're a non-resident to be able to utilize those fishing access sites. An interesting op-ed from the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation was recently published in several news outlets concerning the Cottonwood decision and how it makes resource management difficult for federal agencies. In 2015, a case involving the Cottonwood Law Firm versus the Forest Service made it that whenever a federal project is under review, any new evidence must be considered before the project can continue. The op-ed continues to explain and use the example of a forest thinning project where managers had been trying to thin out beetle-killed trees that were unnaturally dense to improve wildlife habitat and to reduce wildfire risk. Despite the Forest Service going through the environmental review process, the thinning had been halted because of failure to address the impacts on Canada lynx and grizzly bears. After the project had been halted, lightning struck the area and sparked a large forest fire that likely burned more intensely than if that thinning had actually occurred. In the op-ed, they go on to say that the Cottonwood decision created a continual loop where whenever new information is brought forth, the projects are stalled and nothing gets done, creating a management paralysis of sorts. The Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation did say that they recognize the environmental review is an important part of the process, but that because of things like the Cottonwood decision, it creates a scenario where it is extremely difficult to get things done. In Nevada, the Department of Interior announced a sale for a solar lease totaling 23,675 acres of BLM land for $105 million. In past episodes, we've talked about the push for renewable energy development on public lands, and this is another step in that direction. The Bureau of Land Management had previously characterized this area as being one of low resource conflict. However, some conservation groups have raised concerns over the impact to the groundwater system, also noting the rapid pace at which some of these projects were approved. The BLM is still processing 74 more solar, wind, and geothermal projects to be implemented on public lands throughout the United States. Thinking of these last two news stories, it does seem a little bit ironic to me that the federal land timber thinning project that had been stalled for over eight years could not be completed, yet massive solar and wind projects on public lands are implemented in less than a year. But anyway, the recent Nevada solar project is estimated to provide power to over 2 million homes, but also it is 23,675 acres that will forever be altered and no longer open to public use. With that, we are going to jump into our deeper dive where we are talking about removing fences and migration barriers. Can you believe that, Jake? <laughs> we, we, just, uh, we just covered so much amazing turf related to migration, and Marcus leaned back in his chair after 25 minutes and said, Oh, no, I forgot to hit the record button. It's my first time. I remember uh, many, not many times, but I've heard stories of a lot of times, you know, forgetting to hit the record button on a podcast. Huh? I, I did it once with a podcast. It's, uh, you look down and you have this feeling of, oh, no. In my defense, it was five minutes. We made it five right. minutes into the episode. Yeah. I feel bad. I was looking at the board and I... I should have noticed that the big red button wasn't lit up. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty obvious. Yeah. You'd think that I would have noticed, but no, I did not. Oh, well, anyhow, it, it, yeah. that was a rehearsal. We get, now we get to be and do it for keeps. Yeah, for sure. Um, so. so, yeah, talking migration, talking about uh, migration and migration barriers and animals moving across the landscape and being stopped by various things. Yeah, and yeah. things like the fence. We were, The whole crew, we all went and pulled yesterday. That's why I got... Such a nice sunburn on my neck. I had my big sun hat on, but obviously it didn't work well enough. <laughs> but. 
Yeah, so that was pretty fun. We went out and pulled a, an old five-wire barbed wire fence that had been on the landscape for quite some time, and it was through a migration area, primarily the antelope migrate through. Pronghorn, sorry. Yeah. I used the wrong term. I'm, we got to use the proper term when talking in front of Randy. Randy likes the pronghorn. Pronghorn antelope. Prong- we'll, we'll be okay with that. I'll be, I'm going to bounce back and forth again. Into it. But anyway, no, it was fun to get out there and, like, do a little manual labor, get out, pull a fence. But, yeah, these old these old five-wire fences or a lot of times woven wire fences when they used to run sheep um, across a lot of these western grazing allotments on public and private land. And on the case of yesterday, it was some public, some private. One of them was a block management uh, cooperative, cooperator, which means they offer – uh, hunting on private land, which is pretty cool. So it was yeah. fun. I, I when I'm there, I, my mind besides like, how do I run this fence puller, this post puller enough to get this damn T post out of this rock pile? Uh, you look around that landscape, and it doesn't look like a you know you you think a migration corridor. You think oh, it's probably this tight area where they follow a path, you know, a river bottom or something. This is pretty gradual, but listening to Simon and Colin talk, this stretch of fence got identified because of the GPS collaring. Right. What do they call it? Encounters or disruptions or they, they yeah. have a term for it. Well, and that's what's so cool is like there's a, all this new science now coming out that is, you know, using GPS collars on these pronghorn that they are able to identify these high consequence areas. So they are able to just look at this, High, you know, super fine scale data and see when they encounter a barrier because they'll just be like a hard line on the map. You'll look at these these maps and it's just GPS coordinates that are plotted on the map and then you'll just see a hard line where they hit and they either pace back and forth along a fence line or they had to circumvent it and go around. And then they're able to just like, this is obviously a problem spot. Like you can just see it clear as day. On, and some of, some of those ones you can just see like a polygon of the entire old pasture that was probably woven wire, some impenetrable fence and all of the, all of the dots just go around it and you can just see the outline of this pasture on the map. It's pretty wild. Yeah. So without that type of technology, would either of you looked at that landscape where that fence was and say, Oh, this is a migration corridor. I wouldn't have. No, not enough. Not just by looking at it. I wouldn't have realized. Yeah. And so it's pretty cool because then even though like, you, and then that's the other thing too, is you might have a fence that you would look at and go, oh, that's obviously a barrier. That's a problem fence, but maybe that's just not a historic route that animals are using that often. And so you want to prioritize the routes that the animals are actually using. So by cross-checking with the GPS data, then going and ground truthing and seeing like, what are these barriers? They're able to, you know, identify it. And so, yeah, it's Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, but in cooperation with, like, the well, National Wildlife Federation, Simon was with. Um, there, I know there's, like, Nature Conservancy involvement. There's the BLM, Bureau of Land Management. I'm sure the forest in certain spots. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool, like, the, all these cooperative efforts. And then the private landowners, obviously. Right. So yeah, that's, like, a huge part of it. What, so far, do you know, like, is it for the most part a lot of landowners, are they pretty willing to – get these fences fixed or are some of them pretty stubborn and they don't want them being touched and messed with both. Definitely both. So it depends like, and it often depends on the scenario that they're approached to. Cause sometimes it's going to be a cost sharing thing where they're still going to have to pay for a portion of it. Sometimes it's like subsidized in some fashion, whether one of these NGOs or one of the government agencies is going to pitch in for the whole thing or some of it. And then, um, some people are just stubborn and just don't don't want any assistance <laughs> yeah. assist and just want their old fence. And if it works, it works. But in a lot of cases, these fences are falling apart and they require a ton of work to upkeep them. And so it's kind of a good opportunity for them in some cases. They yeah. can get either help on a new fence or maybe in some cases, does it get paid for or entirely? Yeah, for sure. And so, it, yeah, it all depends on the scenario. But, yeah, I think a lot of times they try to highly incentivize the landowner to... Yeah. To participate in this. This landowner is enrolled in our block management program that allows public hunting on private land, but Mm -hmm. they don't get paid enough in that program to be 
replacing these long stretches of fence. And so you think about 10 of us out there, that was free labor. Right. You know, three folks came all the way from Minnesota. To, yeah, that <laughs> to was impressive. Yeah, that was really <laughs> cool. Those guys, so do you, Mike and uh, Brian Stace, and Stacy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, those guys were awesome. They they had a skid steer with a wire roller on it. Brought which, it all the way from Minnesota. Yeah, <laughs> it was impressive. And they just volunteered their time to come out there and do that. And, like, it made uh, rolling up the fence substantially uh, faster than what we did by hand in, in previous years. But you think that just that probably saved a lot of money. If, if oh, you've yeah. ever went to price, and I have, what fence costs – Per mile. For sure. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing. I mean, regard like it's awesome that we got a volunteer and that there's there is volu- you know, volunteers that go out and help offset that. But there also was a like a pretty big push from the Department of Interior to put money towards identifying these problem areas, like migration barriers and fixing them. So that's that's another thing. So it's they're still gonna have a fencing contractor come in and build a new fence. Right. A, wi- a wildlife friendly fence and so that's still going to be super expensive right. but there's like a significant amount of funding now going towards that so that's that's pretty cool yeah. like they're starting to like put emphasis on this and yeah well when we drove in there and i'm driving along looking at it, i'm like man this is five strand yeah Not, nothing's good they, this is as close to woven fence as you can get when you get five strands and i could see wh- why if there are animals moving through there yeah. how they get obstructed by that it just without collars you don't know how many is it one pronghorn comes through a year or do hundreds of them come through at certain times of the year right yeah and in the case of the fence we pulled yesterday it was the one the bottom wire was super low to the ground and the top wire is pretty tall too and generally pronghorn are going underneath the fences and so with that low bottom wire they just basically weren't going through there they just, they'd hit it and they'd have to go around or find another way through yeah and there's Um, a lot of elk in that area also yeah there's elk there's mule deer there's uh bears there's wolves there's all sorts of stuff that's going to use that landscape and you know hit fences saw a pile of bear poop right on right along the fence line okay i i thought i looked down at that i'm like that looks like bear crap to me yeah i stared at it for a while and i was like I think this is bear. Yeah, yeah it was <laughs> okay. It, I I wasn't seeing things then. But. Yeah. So you, you think about these wide uh, from the wider view of the entire west of migration corridors and how much we're learning about them. Yeah. And how critical it is to the long term sustainability of many of these herds. We probably have disrupted way more corridors than we know. Yeah, for sure. And that's the thing. We already messed up a bunch of them, and some of it we might not never really know about or know to the fullest extent how much we affected. But the fact that we can identify it and either prevent new barriers from going up or helping, you know, mitigate the existing barriers like this. And that's what, so we mentioned this in the, (laughs) before, when I messed up the podcast, what a wildlife friendly fence is. Yeah. And so what a wildlife friendly fence is, is, Instead of having that five wire or woven wire fence that's super hard for them to get through, they've the state Montana State, um, sorry Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks has identified wildlife friendly fencing guidelines, and I think most of the NGOs and government agencies kind of agree that an 18 inch bottom wire and 40 inch top wire is the ideal like height and base of a fence, and then they like the bottom wire to be a smooth wire, and then. Uh, this, yeah, keeping that top wire down. And then also between the top wire and the second wire down, having like a 12-inch gap. Because there's also sometimes that this to leave a gap for a lot of times deer will crawl through that that gap. And so there's these guidelines that they've developed and gone through and this tested over years. And like this is the ideal scenario. And they allow a little wiggle room depending on what suits the landowner's needs. Um, but, yeah. So there's a lot of thought that goes into it. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we have landowners who are cooperating and say, hey, yeah, I, I want to do what I can for wildlife. And uh, we <laughs> we all benefit because a lot of that wildlife migrates either across, through, or somehow onto private lands sometime during their, their annual life cycle. Right. Yeah, and Simon was mentioning uh, that, so Simon works for the National Wildlife Federation, and he was kind of organizing this whole fence pole. And uh, he was telling me about there was exa- examples from this winter in Wyoming where there was a lot of antelope that just they hit a fence and it wasn't even like 
it it wasn't even that impenetrable a fence, but it was just enough that that was the final straw. And they just died along that fence because they just couldn't get through. And so even, you know, just a five wire fence, it's just that much harder for them to get through. And yeah. You'd look at some of those pictures of Wyoming this year and a lot of them would be in fence corners. I suppose they, okay, I'll try this way. I'll try that way. And they keep going back and back and, then you see these pictures, there's 40 dead antelope in a really small area near a fence corner. Yep. Yeah, and then even, um, and this was previous year's data, but in the Madison Valley, um, Jesse DeVoe, who was doing the res- a lot of the research stuff on the project in, in Montana, he was showing me these maps, and they had hit the fence on one side of the highway heading down the Madison Valley, and then they'd have to backtrack and hi- and walk, like, four or five miles to the north. And then they found a place to cross the fence and cross the road and cross another fence. And so they ended up, instead of crossing what would typically be one fence, they had to hike an extra like 12 miles and cross three fences, what would have just been one fence. And so, and cross the road too. So it's just like all of those things are another point of where they could get stuck in the fence. They could get hit by a car. It's this extra mileage that they're putting on going through snow and so it all adds up. And so, like, and that was one instance. You know, that's, like, one example on the map that probably took place of in half a day. And so it's, anyway, well, definitely. I, I think it's really cool that all this research is being done. Probably the leaders in it would be the Wyoming Mi- Migration Initiative that's housed out of the University of Wyoming. Uh, that in the Middleton lab, Dr. Middleton, who's out of UC Berkeley, they have done it on elk, they've done it on moose, on bighorn sheep, pronghorn, mule deer, every species they have done it on. And the findings all kind of lead us to the same conclusion. Obstacles and barriers and the risk we have that some of the private lands along these corridors could be developed. And it, for me, it, it, as someone who's passionate about conservation and conservation funding, it's like, if we're going to be spending money, <laughs> here's, here's some really critical spots. We should be getting the best bang for our buck. Right. And that's what one of the, the cool things, like what we did yesterday, too, is people can volunteer for these projects. Like, the great place is to reach out to 2% for conservation, and they can facilitate you to help out with these projects. Because, you know, donating money is great, but also time. And so... It's, it's pretty fun to just go do some manual labor for a little bit, honestly. Oh, I, I thought it was a ton of fun, Jace. Oh, yeah. It was beautiful day out there, beautiful oh, it landscape. It was fun. You had to yeah. be outside. Beats yeah. editing videos. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it, it helps break things up, for sure. Yeah. Uh, in the summer, well, that, that, I asked uh, uh, Mike and Brian and Stacy, the three from Minnesota, how did you guys get connected to this? What, what brought you out here? Because this is their third year of doing it. I said, oh, we're a 2% for conservation business. And we reached out to Jared at 2%. And he said, yeah, put us in touch with Simon. And so this is what we like to do. That's awesome. It's, it's, it's cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, another thing that I want to uh, see if you guys have heard about that I'm excited about, Simon was talking about this as well, is virtual fencing. What? Virtual fencing. Is that for like so. cattle and ranchers? Yep. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm assuming if I'm understanding almost kind of like a invisible e collar fence that like yeah. people would use for dogs. Exactly. Yeah. Right? So that would be what a lot of people would be familiar with. You know, you can get, you know, a fence, you know, can get one of those underground wires for your yeah. dog and they can't, it'll shock them if they go past it. So similar principle that uh, it's a uh, GPS based, or, I mean, I think there's a couple different companies too. And so they're, but uh, the one I read about is GPS based and then it, with auditory sounds and then also shock can like basically you can create digital pastures for your cows. And so (laughs) they're, they're testing it on several ranches. There's some, I mean, this has been going on for a few years. There's someone that there's like a rancher in uh, Phillips County, like Northern Montana that has experimented with it. And then also I think the matador in Southwest Montana is going to, is experimenting with it now. And, it's pretty cool because then if you can just remove fences all together from the landscape, like that'd be sign- huge for wildlife. And uh, um, it's probably not going to replace like all fences because people are very skeptical to use it for a boundary fence right now, right. rightfully so. Like there's just a lot, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of kinks to work out, but uh, it's already 
proven pretty effective for at least interior fences. So if you're going to have, you know, several pastures within your ranch that you want to keep cattle separate, you can literally move them from your computer. This like, <laughs> this like slowly, <laughs> slowly shift the, you know, the uh, invisible pasture over. And I didn't hear and that so I feel discussion. Like, I think the writing's on the wall that that's going to be the future of, of some of these operations and it'll be slow to be adopted wide, you know, widely, but I think it's exciting technology and uh, eventually it'll probably just be cost effective because like we said earlier, fencing is super expensive, like building a barbed wire fence, maintaining it. It's it's expensive. It's hard work. Yeah. It's just a lot of work to go fix it every year. You have damage from snow, drifting, elk running through it, whatever. You have to go fix that every year, check it. Yeah. And so it'll be interesting to see how that all comes together. That has me thinking about the fence pole we did last year. We did it on a, on a grazing allotment in a wilderness area and the landowner or the, the allotment holder wanted the fence out of there. So us and some other people went and did that. Right. If this was a virtual fence, as you're describing, that'd be a way easier way to maintain fences because this landowner was tired of trying to maintain fences. Fire had come through 12, 15 years ago, and now every time the wind blows, it blows the fence down. Oh, yeah, for the, sure. The you got am- dead fall, fall, the trees falling on it. Yeah, and so the amount of time and energy they spent replacing and repairing fence, trying to keep cattle away from critical areas of riparian habitat and stuff was extensive. Yeah. Now I'm like, huh. That, that whole problem would have went away with a virtual fence. Eh? <laughs> yeah. No, it'll be interesting. But, yeah, yeah, and then, I mean, I guess we're running out of time, but, like, as far as barriers go, fences are just one of the issues, too. So there's all sorts of other stuff. Like, uh, I mean, roads are a huge one, right? And that we've talked about this also in past episodes, but just uh, trying to mitigate uh, – the issue of wildlife crossing roads getting hit by cars. They, there's all this uh, infrastructure money now going into crossings, like these giant overpasses or underpasses in some cases, and they've been largely successful too. And unfortunately, Montana's a little late to the game in some of that respects, but um, I talked to Simon about that as well yesterday, and it was interesting because talk he's been talking with biologists about that, and he's just like, it's just so hard to identify like one key spot because whereas in Wyoming you have these like well-defined migration routes that are just like a ton, like thousands of animals passing through. And it's like, yes, this is where we, we need the crossing right here. Whereas in Montana, a lot of the examples are just more spread out. And it's like, we could use a crossing here, but we could also use one here and here and here and here. You know, it's yeah. just like, there is not that like defined line of like, where they need to get across the interstate or get across these highways. And so, but there's, they're working on it and there's money that's being allocated to it. So that's another exciting thing. Cause there's a lot of roads that completely like interstate corridors are huge barriers. For yeah. Huge. A yeah. lot of wildlife. Yeah. Because you got the fence on each side of the interstate, yeah. you got two to however many lanes of traffic, then you have the big meridian in between. And there's oh. a lot of noise, a lot of noise. You have power lines that are, making noise usually on the long side of them, all that adding up. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's it's exciting to me that people are, it seems like, starting to care and, and act on it now. And so there's there's good science that's pointing us in the direction of what places need to be fixed. And um, when, you, when you can identify those key spots, it's, it's a lot easier to focus an effort yeah. in those um, spots. But. I, I think that... If we don't pay attention to these, we're going to lose the loss of our migration corridors. And like you said, we don't know how many of them we probably lost kind of by accident. Nobody said, oh, I'm going I'm to build this reservoir here so I can ruin a migration corridor. We just didn't know. Right. And so now we have the technology that's making that possible to identify and, and conserve them. Yeah. So I'm, I think it's cool. It's awesome. I love when we, like driving – through Nevada and seeing all those overpasses and underpasses. That's like my favorite part of the drive. It's so yeah. cool seeing all the the work that they've done right there. I make that drive fairly yeah. often, so it's kind of cool to see. Yeah, because that, that is a well-defined migration coming out of that uh, Jabbridge area. They migrate southeast over to 
towards Wendover, and it's a long migration. Not quite as long as the Wyoming migration for me there, but long. Yeah. And, you know, some of these aren't, uh, when you read the studies, they're not 100-mile migrations. Some of these are only 12, 15, 20-mile migrations. But if you add all those up, they're super important to large herds of animals. And so if we can make it easier for them, all the better for us and them. Yeah, for sure. Well, we hit 20 minutes, but... uh People should definitely check out 2% for Conservation and find definitely. some sweet fence pole volunteer projects. And not and there's other opportunities too, but Jared's usually good at having a pulse on uh, places that people can volunteer. Yeah, go do it if you can. You're going to have a ton of fun. It's going to give you a tangible feel for this maybe nebulous term we always say, conservation. Yeah, Th- This is conservation, these kind of things. And it'll give you, one, a sunburn, a good feeling about it, and – You'll, you'll feel like, hey, this is what conservation is. You get to meet a lot of cool people, too, with yeah. like-minded passions, and it's pretty cool. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thank Marcus. You. Appreciate it.